Hello kiddos. <clears throat> Today we're going to start um, our gases unit and the first podcast is just going to be about general empirical properties of gases. Empirical properties are things like you would you could test in a lab, things that are that are observable. So let's take a look at our objectives for today. Our object objectives for today or for this podcast anyways, introduce the empirical properties of gases, so how do gases behave? Describe STP and SATP in terms of pressure and temperature and convert between Celsius and Kelvin. So that's all we're going to do. And this one here, STP and SATP, all the conditions of gases found at STP and SATP are found in your data booklet. So in your data booklet, um, there are some squares or some boxes, as you know. And on the front page, on the top right-hand corner, there's some info there. And on the back page, top right hand corner, there's a little bit of information there to help you out with, uh, th with gases. So all gases have different chemical properties, but they very much have similar physical properties. Let's take a look at some chemical properties. Gases are either very reactive, like fluorine, chlorine, and oxygen. Slightly reactive like nitrogen, that's why the air is mostly nitrogen because it's not very reactive. And they can be inert, which are your noble gases. Those are inert. Inert means they don't react. Now, uh, scientists are funny. They always want to do things that they can't do. So they actually have found a way to react with xenon. But it's under very, very strict conditions under the lab. Uh, okay, so continue on with gases. Some physical properties, these are really important, regardless of chemical properties. So regardless if they react or not, all gases, the way we can tell the volume of gases is that they fill their container, right? They, so they have no definite shape or volume, but they can fill a container and that way we can measure the volume. They are highly compressible. So if I increase the pressure, it de uh, only, I can only increase the pressure when I decrease the volume. They're highly compressible kiddos because of the spaces between the gases. So if I have a container here, right, there, and I have a container of gases, you'll see that there's lots and lots of space. So if this is the, um, the top of the container and I push down on it, and let's say I squish it to here, what happens is I'm just manipulating the amount of space in between. So that's why they're compressible. They diffuse through any available space. So if I'm in a room, what that means is if I'm in a room and right at my door I spray some perfume, the people here are going to smell it after a while. Have they have volume and or pressure affected by temperature. So you can imagine if I have some gas, I will draw a little picture of that. If I have some gas, and it's moving at a, at a certain rate. The, the molecules are moving, the, the gas particles are moving at a certain rate. If I attach a flame to it, I'm going to increase the movement. It's going to increase the movement. They're going to move faster. They're going to move a lot faster than if, they, uh, if I didn't increase the temperature. And then we have to take a look at what pressure means in terms of chemistry and in terms of gases, because it's a bit different than possibly what you think pressure is from, from previous studies or previous knowledge. <clears throat> if I increase the temperature or if I increase the volume, if the container can expand, I can change the pressure, okay? So let's take a look at, again, some more gases, um, some more gas information. Empirically, it's a substance that fills the shape of any container, diffuses rapidly, mixes with other gases easily, increases in pressure. So it increases in pressure and or volume when heated. So when I inc introduce temperature into the, into the mix, it's gonna, the, te the pressure is going to increase and the volume is going to increase. It's going to decrease in pressure with the increase in volume. So if I, if I, what that means, if I increase the volume, if I, if the container gets larger, the pressure decreases. Pressure, typically as seen as force per unit area, meaning that um, if I'm standing on your foot and I'm wearing flat shoes, it's not going to hurt as much as if I'm standing on your foot and I'm wearing uh, very pointy heeled 
or very thinly pointed heeled um, shoes. So the unit is in kilopascals or in ATMs, and that's in that in your data booklet as well. Kilopascals or ATMs, atmospheres, are just ways of measuring pressure. They're caused by the collisions of gas particles with the sides of a container. So in, in chemistry for gases, we don't look at the square area business. We look at the collisions. How many, how many collisions are there? So obviously, if I'm, if I'm increasing um, the temperature of something, I'm going to increase the pressure because the collisions increase. The collisions increase because the particles are moving much faster. Okay? If I decrease the volume of a substance, the pressure is going to increase because I have less space. If I have less space, I'm going to have more collisions. So that's how you can measure, or that's how you, you should imagine what pressure is. Okay, so let's t look at some practical uses. Snowshoes, snowshoes increase the surface area, right? So you're actually exerting less pressure on the ground. That's why you can walk um, with snowshoes on very deep snow. This allows you to walk over, you know, snow without, I mean, it, it doesn't allow you to walk certainly on the very, very, very surface of it but it can help out with not getting stuck. Pressure exerted by air in all subjects is atmospheric pressure. In all objects, so if I'm, if there's an object here, okay, pressure is going to affect this object in all directions. That's what that means. Another thing you guys can take a look at, as everyone can take a look at, is um, the, the yellow dot, uh, it's yellow, the blue dots are, let's just say, air. So if you take a look at the bottom here, that's at sea level, so that's pretty much where we live. We're a little bit above sea level. Take a look at the pressure. There's a lot of collisions because there's a lot of um, gas particles, air particles. If I go on top of a mountain, okay, you'll notice that there's a lot less uh, gas particles, air being air. So there's a difference in, in pressure in terms of the atmosphere. Pressure exerted by air in all objects, standard temperature and pressure at STP. So STP means standard temperature and pressure. It's 101.325 kilopascals and 0 degrees Celsius. But laboratory temperatures are not at 0 degrees Celsius because that would be too, way too cold. So scientists came up with something different. They came up with standard ambient temperature and pressure. Pressure ambient means basically room temperature. So standard ambient temperature and pressure is at 100 kilopascals instead of 101.325 and at 25 degrees Celsius instead of zero. Obviously that's way more comfortable for scientists to um, perform their studies. At sea level the ap uh, average atmospheric pressure is about 101 kilopascals. Scientists use this value to define one standard temperature or one of uh, one atmosphere as 101.325 kilopascals. So Here's an example of, um, of ways that we can measure temperature. Another way we can measure temperature, okay, is at standard temp atmosphere, right? So at S STP, are millimeters of mercury, okay? So you can measure it with atmospheres, kilopascals, and millimeters of mercury. This is not in your data booklet, therefore it needs to be memorized. So scientists also used a mercury barometer to measure atmospheric pressure. So standard pressure is also defined at 760 millimeters of mercury. There's other things you can talk about. Um, you can use a barometer. And there's other ways that you can measure temperature, okay? Or sorry, pressure. Also, like in your tires, you use something, you use another measurement of how to measure pressure. But for us here, this is what you need to know at STP. 101.325 kilopascals is equal to one atmosphere, which is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So when a tube filled with mercury is inverted, the weight of the column of the mercury pulls it towards Earth. However, the weight of the air directly above the open dish pushes down on the surface of the mercury and prevents all of the mercury from uh, falling out of the tube. Basically, this is just showing you how um, a pressure, it's almost, ex how a pressure gauge works in terms of using mercury. You're not going to be tested on this. This is just some background info. The two opposing forces balance each other when the height of the mercury is about 760 millimeters at zero degrees, kiddos, okay, because it's at ST STP. Uh, if the vertical mercury fill, fill tube is longer than 760 millimeters, the mercury drops to 760 millimeters. Okay, basically, 
I'm just giving you some background information. So what's going on? A student took a photo of an empty soda bottle at rest um, area in the Rocky Mountains. Their GPS helped determine the altitude, so they, they were able to know that at above sea level, uh, 6,350 feet above sea level, compared that to 50 feet above sea level. So what happened is in here, okay, they, they were able to retrieve or to capture some air at uh, very high above sea level. As they brought it down 50, at 250 feet above sea level, all of a sudden the pressure around the air was able to, to contract this, this bottle. So that just tells you that air pressure is a thing and it could be, it could be, it could be pretty dangerous. Okay, so when they returned to sea level, the bottle um, collapsed because of air pressure. And you, and you know why? Because air pressure is different. As you go up, right, as you move higher, air pressure decreases. So here's an example again of how that, what's going on. If you can imagine, these are columns of, of uh, air. So when we're over here, kiddos, we are, um, I guess, we live with this pressure pushing down on us. And look at all this column of, of air that's pushing down on us. That, but we're, you kind of, wherever you live, you, you just acclimatize to that, to that environment. People that live in higher altitudes, they're, they're, they're just acclimatized to that. If we go and we hang out at a higher altitude, it's going to be hard for us for a few days, but then we eventually get used to it. So the picture shows how much air is in the column above Marnie than Deanna. The air pressure at sea level is greater than at Deanna's elevation. That makes sense. And I found also a GIF just to show you at high altitudes compared to at sea level, the difference in air pressure. So let's take a look at temperature. It's how hot or cold an object is. Well, no, not really. Not for chemistry. It's the average kinetic energy of the particles of a substance. And you guys remember kinetic energy means energy of movement. And we look at the particles in terms of movement. Absolute zero is the coolest thing ever. It's the lowest temperature that can be obtained. The kinetic energy of all entities of solids, liquids, or gases would become zero. Movement stops kiddos at absolute zero. So ke at Kelvin temperature scale, absolute zero is zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is equal to negative 273 degrees Celsius-ish. It's actually negative 273.15 degrees Celsius in the negative. That's pretty cold. Celsius temperature scale, zero is when water freezes. And in the Kelvin scale, it's 273 Kelvin-ish. But in your data booklet, it's 273.15. So that's what we use for calculations. So to convert degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273, but actually you're adding 273.15. To convert Kelvin to degrees Celsius, you subtract 273.15. So just make sure that's 15, because it's what it says in the data booklet. Sometimes people do round it, but for everybody's sake, let's just agree to use the, the information in your data booklet, which is 273.15. Here's some, some examples where you are... Um, trying to go from Kelvin to Celsius and Celsius to Kelvin. What is 254 Kelvin in degrees Celsius? It's negative 19.15 degrees Celsius. What is negative 34 degrees Celsius in Kelvin? The answer is 239.15 Kelvin. So, um, so do STP and SATP change? Yes, using Kelvin you have different numbers to use. Standard temperature and pressure at STP, kiddos remember, it's 101 kilopascals and, and 0 degrees Celsius. But for, for more specifically, we go 101.325 kilopascals and 273.15, okay? We are going to use the data booklet. We just decided um, as a science community at the school here at MAC that we're going to use 273.15. Standard ambient temperature and pressure, 298.15 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals. <clears throat> That's it, kiddos. So just let that sink in, and we'll continue with gas laws in, um, in our next podcast.